courtesy of Brad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. I'm Dan, back with Matt, and we have had an interesting week for the Flames. But Matt, for the first time, one of us got our predictions right for the past week. Spoiler alert, not me. <laughs> Craig Connor, you say we have to get comfortable with one nothing leads, and I'm very comfortable with a one nothing lead right now. Yeah, especially because I'm so trash at the, the prediction game, so... <laughs> We've both been equally trash. But over 12 years, yes, you have been. Anyway... Uh, should we jump into the last season for the fl- or the last week for the Flames? Definitely. Three games all at home. The Flames are back, and they started the week off against the Arizona Coyotes. Um, this was a uh, their first game back after a bit of a, I guess, an extended hiatus, and they ended up winning in OT three to two. What were your thoughts on this game? Uh, I thought the Flames fared well against the Coyotes. I was very worried about. Th- how they would respond after uh, beating the pants off of them uh, last week, six to two. Uh, so, you know, like I had in the prediction thread had uh, said that, that uh, the Flames, I was expecting them to lose this game, but uh, they managed to endure basically. And uh, fourth straight win, win in a row. And y- usually you see teams not do well when they come home after a long road trip. No, and like this was the first game of what in effect was a seven game road trip. There was one home game, but like they were in and out. So, yeah, I'm more or less a big road trip. Yeah, more or less. Just change your underwear and get on the road again. Yep. Um, you know, I thought overall, I mean, the Coyotes are better this year than we've seen in the past, but I don't think that the Coyotes played a really great game. I don't think the Flames played a really great game either, though, in this one. No, the first two periods, frankly, were. Uh, amongst the most boring two periods I've seen, which is very fairly typical of Arizona games. Uh, you know, like even like going back to when Keith Kachuk was their captain, like the Coyotes have been basically as boring as possible ever since then. So, you know, just a couple of years. And, <laughs> you know, but the third period, especially after the Coyotes took the 2 nothing lead, Calgary's like, uh, no, we're not going to lose to Arizona, so let's actually play hockey. And it got really exciting after that point. Yeah, we beat them 6-2 in Arizona on the 11th, 3-2 here in Calgary in this one. And, you know, like you said, there was the 2 nothing lead for Arizona. One thing we're seeing more from the Flames this year that we haven't seen last year, and I'd even say for the past couple of years, that ability to come back from being down by two or three like you know in the past we would have seen this team down by two and they would just fold it up shop and gone home yeah and the resiliency from this team and like arizona throughout the contest was taking liberties with the flames physically uh pospisil got uh low bridged a bit by uh um dumba and you know landed face first on the ice and yeah, that inspired him later on on the rush for the tying goal uh, to make that nice pass across the cadre. And, you know, it, it's one of those where most of the time, like if the games got chippy in years past, that like the team would sink down and, you know, it you could contain the flames by just physically taking it to them. And it's like, oh, good, you're hitting us good for you uh we're gonna go score now and it almost gives him energy this year yeah which is a nice change of pace and uh that shot by sharon govich in overtime was one of the single best shots i've seen a flame take and i think it like really decades. shows <laughs> i think it really shows that sharon govich is a core part of this team yeah like that was you know as good of a shot he looks that, like a top star yeah like that's a first line forward. That's a goal scores type goal. And um, the more confident, like he's been really riding high the past couple of weeks, the more confident he gets in his ability to do things like that, uh, the better it is for the flames over the long term. And, you know, looking at the whole team, like for players with a high quality slap and wrist shot, like it's basically Sharon Govich and Manjapane. And not really too many high quality shots be- besides those two. So it's important for both him not, and us. 
Yeah, I would say not high quality, both slap shot and wrist shot. But I think we're seeing, you know, I, I know I'm seeing for the first time, Coleman's got a better shot than we've seen in a while. Yeah. He, he Well, you can tell that he's doing a lot better physically after all those off-season surgeries. Um, that, you know, like he broke his career high later on in the week and for points in the season, and he uh, broke his career high in goals uh, with the 20th on that in the Coyotes game. Before I move away from the Coyotes game, I will just state I like the I like that the Coyotes have gone back to their original. I think they call them the Kachina jerseys. I like those better than the old kind of brick colored Coyote jerseys. Yeah, the Detroit Red Wings knockoff jerseys that they had for like ten years. Yeah, uh, but I mean that darker kind of maroony color. Yeah, same template, darker color. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I like these, and I've always liked unique. You know, when teams do something unique, like the original Mighty Ducks, you know, colors were unique. Even the, like the, uh, the uh, San Jose Sharks, uh, their striping pattern on their jerseys w- was always interesting. When well, they and their first color's in. different, too. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, it, it's more fun to have weird colors. And as much as, like, they're blinding, like, Nashville's bright yellow highlighter jerseys are fun, too, because... Like, they're literally one of the few sports teams that have yellow as their primary. Yeah. Yeah, I've always preferred the, for the same reason, I've always preferred L.A. with their sort of yellowy orange and purple. Yeah, I agree. And the more unique, you know, it's boring when you have, like, literally, as I mentioned, like the Coyotes being like the Red Wings knockoff or the Lightning being Toronto Maple Leafs uh, with a a little bit less stripes. (laughs) Well, well, we talk about boring jerseys. The Maple Leafs, one of the boring jerseys in the league, came to town on Thursday. Um, this was quite an interesting game for the Flames. We found out before this that Markstrom was hurt. So Dan Vladar was put in net. They called up uh, Wolf before this game. And I heard a lot of fans not being happy with the fact Wolf didn't play. To me, you don't put a young goalie like Wolf in against some of the best shooters in the league in Toronto and Edmonton. Like These were, in my opinion games Dan Vladar had to start. No, and as much as, like, we were just discussing uh, Sharon Govich's confidence, like, you don't need a good young goaltender coming in and getting shell-shocked um, by having to deal with the best of the best. Like, we saw going back, uh, like, when Marc-Andre Fleury first came into the NHL, and, like, the Penguins just basically threw him to the Wolves, and it took him a long time to rebound from that to really cement himself as a top-end goaltender. And, you know, like, it did him a great disservice, I think. And, you know, the Flames, I think, did well uh, to prevent Wolf from getting thrown to the Wolves um, and just letting Vladar steal the show on both nights. And, well, yes... Wolf is exciting. You got to remember Vladar is still the backup. Like to me, it's, you know, the backup is the guy that's supposed to go in when the starter doesn't play. Well, and and on top of that, like we have mentioned like the feasibility of potentially trading Markstrom. You need to know. You got see what you got in Vladar. Yeah. You need to evaluate everybody. Like it's not just a zero sum game. Like you need to know that like if you do move Markstrom that you're not going to completely bone yourself for years in case Wolf doesn't turn out that, you know, like, what happens if, like, Vladar turns into, like, Alex Alder or any of the other miscellaneous insert random backups that the Flames have had over the last... Eddie or, or Eddie Lack, pardon me. I always get the Vancouver goalies confused. But anyway, they we'll come suck, back to Vladar. So. Let's... <laughs> let's uh, or I guess you could say most of the goalies Toronto's used this yeah, year. Yeah, true. Um... Flames opened the scoring for this one. I was really surprised. They had uh, Sharon Govich and Kadri open the scoring. They were up 2-0 in the game, and that's almost when it felt like Toronto was on a bit of a losing streak, said, all right, enough's enough here. And we got two Matthews goals, a Marner goal, and another Matthews goal. Um, End of the first through the second, and then we had Manjapani score at the end of the second. No scoring in the third. This was about what I expected. Like, Toronto is a good team, even though they were on a losing streak, and you got lit up by some of the best scorers. Yeah, and these two games highlight exactly why the Flames should retool. Um, The Flames don't have an answer for those guys. Uh, They can't have their own star player 
go and answer back when like Matthews or McDavid decide to pop off and you know like there was nobody on the flames that was able to single-handedly uh create scoring chances at will like uh some of the Leafs players were in this game or McDavid and Dreisaitl in the following game and it it's tough because you know you can hold your own and like the Flames in effect lost both games by a single goal um save the empty netter on the one but you know like it, it's just not enough to consistently be able to beat better teams with the, the star players which if you're actually wanting to compete for a Stanley Cup you need to actually have weapons that you can throw up back at them for sure these two games this one and the one we're about to talk about against Edmonton I think really show where the Flames deficiencies are yeah and I think you know even with Markstrom and Nett I, I don't know you would have fared I mean you maybe you would have won but I think you would have fared about the same even with Markstrom and Nett yeah, it, you have to credit Vladar, like especially in the Edmonton game, which we're getting to. But like, the, there was nothing that was egregiously a, like, "What the heck was that?" type goal. Like it was, everyone was full value in this game. Uh, he just got beat by two of the best snipers in the NHL, and you know it's yep. hard to do anything when you know, like literally any goaltender in the NHL would have got beat by any of those shots. Toronto takes season series now. They won the first one 5-4 in OT on November 10th, and this one 4-3. So um, there, maybe next year. Yep. And then the last game of the week, the Battle of Alberta. Both teams wore their Heritage Classic jerseys, which I still am not a fan of, especially the Edmonton ones with that stupid script under the oil drop. Um, but it, was a, it should have been a good Saturday night tilt. I found this to be... One of the most boring games I can remember for the Flames in a while with a 3-1 three, three to one Edmonton win. Yeah. The Flames really did not do a whole heck of a lot in this game. Um, like, they were... I didn't think Edmonton did either. No. Like, the Oilers were uh, all over the Flames in the first period. And, like, it was just a matter of time before they did score one. Um, like, you knew that it had to happen with how many good chances they were getting. Like Calgary. And maybe the yeah. maybe the positive for the Flames is he kept McDavid off the score sheet. The goals were Mc, were Ryan McLeod, Sam Gagne, and Zach Hyman. Yeah, and you know the the Sam Gagne goal that was just the weirdest of bounces, and you know they happen every once in a while where you just get a really dumb goal that that just happened. It, it you know you can't help when luck decides to you know ricochet everything just in the right way to pinball it in the net you know like it, like how you pass the puck out from behind the net and it ends up in the far top corner you know like if you tried that a million yeah. times you would not get a puck to go in that area but it did and like not much and, you, can you know do. for every one that goes in you're hoping your team and you generally will i think over the course of the season you'll get one back at some point like yeah that. just weird dumb bounces and Every every year in the NHL, I forget Sam Gagne is still an NHLer until we play against the Oilers. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know. You're right. The Oilers were all over the Flames. The Flames did not look like they'd come to play, I didn't think. And as the game went on, it just seemed like they got more disconnected from the game. Yeah, and like you have to credit Vladar for making so many saves that were like high quality that like this could have been a laugh or blowout if what our wasn't on his game but like he robbed so many different Oilers players like it could have easily been eight or nine to one if uh, sure. the puck luck was not going his way but he uh you know full credit to him like he made some highlight reel saves that were just you know like there was that one diving and cross save that you know like that's a highlight real save uh save of the week save of the month type of thing and if if you were not a calgary flames fan and didn't know that dan Vlar was the backup goalie i think in this one you would have just thought we had our starter out there yeah exactly and you know that's why like vladar's stats are a little misleading because in both of the games like he looked really good and yet like between the two games he walks away with the three plus goals against average and, you know, less than 900 save percentage, and yet, you know, like, it, 
the, that was actually exceptionally good considering the two games and I feel that he's been on the end of a number of those games where like it should have been a lot worse <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, that's why we don't always scout just by stats alone. No. A um, couple notes in this one. Adam Klapka made his NHL debut. We saw him skate and do his lap before the team came out. He, he played in the preseason. We were pretty happy with him in the preseason. Made his debut here. I thought he looked as expected. Like, you know, Adam Klapka is not going to be a guy that blows you away, especially in a loss. But for, you know, a fourth-line guy, I thought he came as expected and Matthew Coronado got recalled here um, we had Martin Postel injured in that Toronto game just a few minutes in he's going to be out until after the All-Star game we'll talk more about that in a little bit so so Coronado slotted in with Zari and Kadri what do you think of both those guys I thought Coronado was in over his head again just like he was during the early part of the season um, he just needs to get bigger and stronger in the offseason and uh, you know, come in with a better game plan. It's not like panic red alert or anything. I mean, he's looking great in the A. Yeah, it, it's just he's clearly a first year pro, and mm-hmm. you know, it's going to take a bit. And it, it is, you know, like a, it's probably going to take him two years to like fully cement himself in the NHL. But you can tell the talent is there. It's just he has to adapt with his size and the lack of time that he has in space to be able to be an effective NHLer. And I have to imagine when you're a top prospect like him, you almost think that, you know, you're ready for the league right away. And I, he's got to be frustrated too by the same things that you and I are mentioning. So it's, hopefully it's an easy conversation for the coaching staff to say, you know, the talent's there, get bigger, get stronger, and come to training camp, put on some muscle. And we used to hear Brad Treliving say it even at the uh, rookie development camp that, you know, these these are boys and they need to bulk up to be men. And I still think that Klapka, or sorry, not Klapka, Coronado, still needs to bulk up a little bit and needs to get stronger so he can play with men. Yeah, and like we saw, uh, you know, like uh, Jack Hughes when he first came to the NHL and like he struggled mightily and said that, you know, like a couple months ago I was playing against high schoolers and now I'm lining up against Sidney Crosby. Of course I'm going to struggle. Mm. Like, you know, and it's that kind of thing. Like, the NCAA mm. is not a professional league. It's a league long cry and, from the American League. You know, and it's tough to go from that and slot in. And, like, there, there's a reason why it's when players do actually transfer over from the NCAA into the NHL and succeed right away, that's more of an exception than the rule. And, you know, I think this is a great example of why the American League is so important. You know, I mean, Matt Coronado is not quite ready for the NHL. We we both agree with that. And I think anyone who watched him could see he's over in of his head. But he's doing fantastic in the AHL. And I think lets him see what it's like to play at the pro level. But also gives him that, you know, big fish in the small pond place to dominate. To show that, yes, you can play the hockey. You got to work on a few of the other things. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I do have to give uh, a little bit of credit uh, in the Oilers game. Andrew Mangiapane, I think, played his best game of the season in that one. Um, my main critique of Mangiapane over the last two years and why I've like mentioned the buyout and all that as a possibility is mainly due to the fact that when he was successful, he played with a little bit of a chippy, nasty edge to his game and would get mixed up with the other team you know, after the whistle a bit, would be right in the middle of things and, you know, engaged. And I felt that that part of his game showed up a lot in the Oilers game. And, you know, if he can play like that, he will find more success. But when he's playing very passive, he goes into, like, perimeter invisible mode, and that doesn't really help anybody. And I wonder with Manjapani how much of that also comes down to different minutes. Like we're seeing him playing third line minutes over the last couple, you know, weeks with Backlund and Coleman. And I wonder if he feels like he can do more of that because he's he's got limited minutes. Maybe he's feeling better. He's not feeling as blown up. Yeah. I don't know, but he just. I mean, I've always said I think this guy's a second third line guy, and I think seeing him on the third line, he's finally effective there, as opposed to when they're trying to shove him onto the first line. I agree, and it's one of those where hopefully he can figure it out uh, over the balance of this season and, you know, 
have something to work on heading into next year. And well, I, that, I do want to uh, mention about Adam Klapka. I thought that his physical presence in the game, uh, he had a couple of good hits and played solidly. Um, I think, he was as as you expected for him on the fourth line. Yeah, he, he's not going to be like the goon type guy. He's just a giant who will body check and you know may, occasionally make a good pass or shot. And I thought he played his game well for what he did. And I was glad that the Flames brought his parents over because I think that's always special. Yeah, I mean, that's something the Flames really try to do is make sure the parents are there. And that was one of the frustrations last year with Daryl is they didn't know when some of the young guys were going to play the first game. The Flames didn't know when to bring the parents in. And I think that's awesome that that's so important to the Flames organization. Yeah. Especially coming all the way from Prague. uh, Yeah. And you've got to imagine, I don't know what the time difference is between here and Prague, but like they had to be exhausted by the time they got here because... I mean, we knew Klapka got recalled early in the week, so it's not like they got here the same day. But if you've ever taken a long trip like that, you're exhausted for a couple days with that kind of time change. Yep. And I don't know when they're going back, but that's a heck of a long way to come to see your son play. Yep. Which uh, I'm glad that they managed to make it happen for them. Me too. Well, with that, if we look at the Western Conference wild card. Uh, race the Calgary Flames are now fifth in the wild card race at 47 points, 21 wins, 20 losses, five overtime losses. Seattle's right above them at 47 as well, and Arizona also 47, taking up the fourth and third spots. The two wild card spots are held by Nashville, who has 51 game or 51 points, and LA who has 52 points. Now we've talked about this before. Uh, some of those teams have game in hand on Calgary. Like we've got LA who's got 52 points in 43 games. Calgary's got 47 points in 46 games. So, um, you know, while it seems like you can beat them, you got to keep those games in mind too. Matt, I yeah, mean, and like it, realistically, if you look on the negative side of it, like the Flames are only three points up on the Buffalo Sabres for six I was about last. To say that. Yeah. And you know, like that's not far to fall. <laughs> No, and I mean, even if we look in the West, so Calgary's got 47 points. Below us is St. Louis at 46, Minnesota at 45. I think either of those teams could jump over Calgary, you know, a couple points. You got Anaheim at 31, Chicago at 30, and San Jose at 26. Like, you're not going to plummet as far as Anaheim, Chicago, or San Jose, but I think you could easily move here from 6th or from 5th to 7th and swap spots with Minnesota if you get a, a bad week. Yeah, definitely, and you know you could slide all the way down into like where uh, you're in the same conversation with Columbus and Ottawa, uh, who have 35 and 37 points. Um, but yeah, like it, it, especially like if the Flames do sell off people, like the the team will be heading in a downward trajectory just naturally, and. You know, it's frust- like that's part of the frustrating part of like, oh, well, we're only three points out of a playoff spot, but realistically, you also have so many teams that are between you and there that it's very, very hard to actually. Make yeah, up and even that with ground. the game in hand, some of the teams below us are you know probably actually going to get more points than we will. Yeah. So it's it, it's it'll be an interesting you know I guess couple months now to see where the Flames go because they're. So close, yet so far at the same time. Yeah, and you can say the the same thing about the Eastern Conference. Like, it's the same jumbled mess on their side of the pond, too, and it's just very weird season. It is for sure. Well, like... It, Showing it, that league parity, right? Yeah, well, like, literally going from 11th in the NHL with the Edmonton Oilers down to 27th is only, like, nine points. <laughs> like, that's a lot of teams in that <laughs> section there. It is. So. And, you know, I, I said this, I think, last week. I think that for once, you're going to see a very eventful April in this league. Like, not just for a couple teams, but I think that whole month of April is going to be really exciting. Yeah, it's going to be definitely the playoff race of, you know, the last few years. Like, usually, like, seven or eight of the teams are decided. Like, I remember a couple years ago where it was like, oh, well, Boston's playing Toronto in round one. <laughs> yeah. And it's January. Uh, yep. Got to figure out which seed's playing which, but yeah, you know what's coming. And uh, at least the, exactly. the games are meaningful now. 
Very true, my friend. Um, looking at the goaltending, we talked a little bit about this. Markstrom is now back. He's off the injured reserve, but Dan Vladar played two of the three games this week. He's played 16 games this year, seven wins, zero shutouts for a 3.27 GAA and an 8.88 save percentage. Do you, I mean, we, we've thrown around the idea. I think a lot of Flames media have thrown around the idea of what if Jacob Markstrom gets traded? And I don't think you immediately go to Dustin Wolf, especially this year. You need two goalies, right? You need to make sure you've got two guys. And after these two games against two of the teams with the best scores in the league, I think that Dan Vladar has shown that he might be able to hold, whether here or somewhere else, he might be able to hold down a starter job. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, Vladar looked, and frankly, even though his stats look absolutely horrendous, he's looked really good for most of the games that he's played in. And, you know, like, for a rebuilding team, like, he's like the prototypical guy that you want as your starting goaltender during that phase of like competent enough where he's not going to you know cost you games all the time by himself but you know also not going to necessarily be an elite goaltender either just a decent starting goaltender and you know i think a guy who it looks like learns from every game he plays like i can't yeah. and it's probably happened but at least not this year i can't think of a time that he's looked worse in the last game that he played so, you know, it, he's a guy that I think gets better, and he's the kind of goalie, I think, the more that he gets put in the net, the better he's going to get. And he might have a rocky first year playing 40, 50 games, but I think he's the kind of guy that will easily grow into a starter job if he was given that option here or somewhere else. Yeah, I agree. So I'm feeling more comfortable that, you know what, if you were to bring Dan Vladar in, and I honestly think, Matt, if the Flames trade... Jacob Markstrom with the trade deadline, you don't immediately go to Wolf. No. I think uh, I, out of res- you've got to give the net to Vladar at that yeah, point uh, and see how he rides out the year. Yeah, it, it would basically be like the uh, where like Vladar gets 50 starts and Wolf gets 30. Like that breakdown of um, like over the balance of the season. So like five out of every eight games goes one way, three the other. And, you know, see where things shake out. And then next year run with those two guys again and see how you know things evolve and you know like give it till january say with that same kind of rotation (laughs) and then you know if things naturally sort themselves out in a different way then you make that apparent yeah i think vladar has at least earned the right to get the start if that happens after the deadline yep and you know you also have to see what you have there there and for sure. A lot of goaltenders, like, it's rare for goalies to be in a top-tier NHL goaltender at the age of 23. Um, Vladar, you know, being 26, like, that's, you know, roughly around the same age that Kipper was when he got the starting job here, and where you start to see a lot of goaltenders really come into their own. Um, so... Yeah, it's one of those where it's a perfect opportunity for both him and the team to both see where this could go. And, you know, even if even if he doesn't end up being your long-term starter, I mean, you've got him under contract this year, next year, even if you're showcasing him at some point to move him as well, at least then teams will be able to see that. I can see a long-term future with Vladar Wolf. But I don't think you can, at this point, discount Vladar. And I see so many fans who just discount Vladar and go right to Wolf as the future. He's, like you said, Vladar's 26. That's still a young goaltender. And, you know, I think we've got to give him just as much opportunity, if not more, than Dustin Wolf to see what he's going to develop into. Oh, for sure. And, like, especially over the next couple of years, like, how would you say? It will become readily apparent, like, if, he's like in the same mold as guys like Peter Mrazek or Vitek Vanacek or Ilya Samsonov where decent enough, but not actually starter material. And I don't think Dan Vladar is the guy we would expect to start when the flames are, you know, in contention for Lord Stanley's mug again. But I think for, you know, a couple of years during a rebuild, retool, refocus, whatever you want to call it, I think he could be a suitable enough starter. Yeah, like there's not really much difference between guys like, say, like Kari Ramo or Jonas Hiller 
or Brian Elliott, who are just serviceable guys that played when the Flames were on the way trying to get back into things. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I think he can be an everyday NHLer. And once he's, maybe this is the wrong f- phrase to use, but once he's outlived his usefulness for the Flames, I think someone else will take him either in trade or free agency, and he can have a long career in the NHL. Oh, I agree. Like, there, if you, you, I mean, if David Riddick's still kicking around, I think Vladar's better than him. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it, it's one of those where basically until he's about 32 or 33, you know, that's when, like, his career will wind down. Uh, or, you know, he'll stay the same if he's actually does find that upper tier. Um, but we'll see. Like, it, it's one of those that you have to give the guy a shot. He's done everything at every level but to this point at a very good clip. So, you know, and things like goals against average and save percentage are largely on the team in front of him, not (laughs) necessarily the goaltender always. And, you know, like you look at the Edmonton game, like the Flames didn't face very many shots in the first period, but boy, they were all breakaways, (laughs) you know, and or great A scoring chances. And it's like, you know, the fact that they only walked away with one goal against, you know, like that was extremely impressive where, you know, a n- normal average game where like, oh, 10 shots against, but they're all perimeter shots. You know, it, giving up one on that is a lot different. For sure. I'm taking a deep breath here. Um, we had a lot of roster moves this week. Like, I don't know if everybody realizes the roster moves that were made. You ready to go through these, Matt? Time for the hokey pokey. <laughs> That's right. Walker Dewar placed on waivers Wednesday. I, I've called this in the past. I said I thought Walker Dewar would end up on waivers sooner rather than later. He did. Surprisingly to nobody, he didn't get claimed. Um, he's now a Calgary Wrangler, which means he just moved down the hall. And he, that allowed for Adam Klapka to be recalled. We'll see what Walker Dewar can do if he can kind of re refine his mojo in the AHL. But um, I am i don't think the Flames are going to be in any rush to bring him back. Yeah, it's one of those he has to earn his way back up. I, I think he's a, not necessarily a permanent banishment to the A, but you know, it'll he has to really show that like he's back to what he was last year uh, to get another shot. And I don't know necessarily if the Flames are going to give him that shot or not. It, it'll largely I think, depend. I on think him. in the yeah, and I think it's going to depend on the guys around him. Like, if Klapka is showing better, I think Klapka stays. I think that he's going to have to earn his way back up because there's so many younger guys that I think the Flames want to see take that spot. Yeah. Dennis Gilbert placed on the IR, uh, injured back on the fourth. I think he was back later in the week. but Yeah, he's he came been back injured. in the Edmonton game. Yeah, he did. Um, so he was injured for a bit back in the lineup. Dennis Gilbert's becoming a better regular NHLer than I expect him to this year. Yeah, I agree. Uh, a very good number six. Yeah, and I think, you know, with that in mind, you might see him retained as a flame next year. Uh, yeah, I would definitely enjoy having him back. Like, he is a very good number six, which, you know, he does the physical side of things. Like, he will fight if need be. Um, and just he's there and you know and he's not constantly giving the puck away or making dumb errors like he's just solid and reliable which perfect martin possible got injured in the toronto game he'll be out for a few weeks we'll return after the all-star game i was worried about this one possible has a has a history of concussions and when they said it was an upper body injury i was worried this might be another concussion he's out for a couple weeks i don't think we know exactly what the injury is but hopefully he's you see young players like this who get this banged up and sometimes it affects their career trajectory. And I'm hoping this is not going to do that for Pospisil. Yeah, it definitely did look like on the play that he did kind of go head first into the boards. It did. So it could very well be another concussion for him and hopefully it's not. And and I, I think something to remember though, like I think, you know, looking back, he's been injured almost every pro season. Like even if he looks like good Ant Scheller, you might not be able to put him as high in your lineup as you expect if you can't get 82 out of him. No. So hopefully he'll be back soon. Um, Oliver Shillington got recalled from his conditioning stint from the Wranglers. That's over now. 
and he has rejoined the Calgary Flames. He will. He's not expected to be on the ice anytime soon. They're still evaluating his return date, but he's back with the team. And then the big news that came out this morning as we record this, Dylan Dubé has been granted an indefinite leave from the Calgary Flames to deal with his mental health. And this sounds a lot like uh, what we saw with with Oliver Shillington here. It's weird the way they've had to word this, that he's on indefinite leave. The NHL's injury reserve only really covers physical injuries. And with the number of guys, at least the Flames have, have had, you know, taking this kind of leave, I wonder if the NHL needs to relook at that definition of IR. Yeah, and we're seeing this a lot more over the last uh, few seasons where uh, Texier with uh, Columbus, he left for a year um you know shillington and now dubé like it it is it's becoming more acceptable um you know i think that instead of uh penalizing teams or players for uh the situation that uh you know the flames will not get any cap relief for him as it sits right yeah and you know like that might weigh on some people of not wanting to impact the team you know because like oh i'm screwing them over so I'll just, you know, stew in the problem instead of getting actual help for it. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I'm hoping at some point the NHL will relook at the definition of IR. And I don't know what you'd have to do to make sure the guy's out and not, you know, you don't want teams taking advantage of it, just saying so-and-so needed a couple of days off. Um, but I'm sure, you know, they can figure that out, have a league, you know, psychologist talk to them or whatever. But I would like to see that changed. And I just want to, you know, compliment Dubé and the Flames here for – announcing that this was a mental health issue. Like I think hockey's, you know, kids grow up looking at hockey players, as these big tough guys. And I think, you know, it used to kind of be, Oh, they get physically injured. But I think to be able to say, Hey, your heroes, your Calgary flames are having mental health issues, just like you might be. And they're taking time away. I think it's really taking away some of that stigma of mental health. Yeah, I agree. And anything that you can do to normalize things. So, you know, random person might, you know, be, you know, contemplating negative, you know, self impacts that, you know, like they might be able to reach out instead. And, you know, the more it becomes normalized instead of, you know, waiting until the damn bursts, you know, finding an outlet to take the pressure off, I think is a great thing. And the, the flames seem to be an organization that's very forward thinking in this. I mean, even before Shillington, didn't they have um, Tyler Parsons who had something similar as well? They went through like, this seems to be an organization that has yeah. been very forward with mental health. Well, even hearkening back to Brian McGrath and uh, yeah. who's spearheaded a lot of this. Yeah, and I think having him in the organization still is probably a good influence on a lot of this stuff. Yeah. So just wanted to commend the Flames there. We hope Dylan Dubé is back sooner rather than later. Uh, he'll be missed on the team. But, you know, good for him for taking the time off. And, Matt, that probably does open up a full-time lineup spot now. You and I both said Coronado doesn't look like maybe the right guy to take that spot at this point. Who would you put in that lineup? Uh... Well, I probably would recall either Schwint or Pedersen, um, just for like they're the next guys ready. Like, yeah, uh, obviously, uh, if uh, Peltier was when ready, Jacob Peltier is ready. I think it goes to him. Yeah, I agree. And uh, even uh, Kevin Rooney, if he was ready, might even. Uh, but uh, right now, as it sits, uh, like it, th- there's pretty much just two or three options right now. And, you know, for my books, it would be Schwent first and then Patterson second. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, if we look at the lineup against Edmonton, we had one spot open. That was the Coronado spot, which was what possible used to have. They, you know, you didn't even notice that, you know, where Dubé's spot would be and, you know, who you'd take out. Like your third line is Manjipani, Backland, Coleman. Your fourth line is Greer, Rajishka, Klapka. You know, we know the kids line and the first line of Huberto, Lindholm, Sharon Govich. Like, I don't, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not like you got to bring in a top six guy. The Flames have, I think, a solid lineup here that even the guy you call up like Schwint could be rotating in and out. Oh, for sure. And, you know, they need to, I think like one of the positives with bringing up either Schwint or Pedersen is to give them that taste in the NHL. 
just so that way, you know, if they're going to take the next step and become full-time NHLers, they know what they need to do because they have not played at the NHL level, either one of them, uh, to this yeah. point. So give them that opportunity and let them rip. And with the next uh, week still at home, it makes it easy to make those call-ups when it's time. Yeah, I agree. So, Matt, we've had uh, some feedback the last couple shows from friend of the show, Al, who's written in quite a bit. Al has opened a floodgate, and we've got a whole bunch of comments, three comments from listeners this week that we're going to go through, three questions. And we're happy to see everybody writing in. We love to talk about what you guys want to talk about and answer your questions. If you want to write in like Andrew did or Terry or our friend Al, uh, feel free to do that on any of our social media channels. You can find them all on our website, firesidechat.ca, up in the top right corner, or if you're on mobile, right near the top. Um, but definitely talk to us. Let us know what you want to hear on the show. And if you're coming out, we'll talk about it later. But if you're coming out Trivia Night on the 8th, ask us your questions there. We, we would love to chat about what you guys want to chat about. First one to get into from Andrew Jepson on Facebook. He asked, why is it that you guys think Zari isn't listed in most Calder, tro Calder Trophy conversations when he's competing with Bedard in points per game? Or why is Lindholm selected as an all-star instead of Coleman? So those are two questions. Let's break down the Calder Trophy first. While he is competing with Connor Bedard, I guess, points per game, if we look right now among rookies... Connor Bedard has 33 points in 39 games, and Connor Zari sixth at 22 points in 36 games. Like he's not, he's he's not scoring the same pace as Bedard is. No, and realistically, uh, you know, like Bedard is champing at the bit to get back in the lineup. Uh, there's been plenty of talk that he's driving people nuts in Chicago. Like, let me back out there. And they're like, no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, but, you know, it, it, Zari's 10 goals difference in almost the same number of games. Played. Yeah, like it, it's one of those where like Bedard, if he returns, say, just past the All-Star break, like the, the Calder Trophy is going to be his. Um, and, you know, like uh, Zari is in that next tier of decent. But, you know, like to me, like Brock Faber is clearly the number two in that race and then everybody else is in that three to eight yeah range. i'd say they're fantilly or hughes for third yeah like that's three to eight they're all you yeah. can make an argument for any of them it's just yeah uh, i i think and i look at this a few different ways so i think that zari's probably the rookie that's come in and had the most impact on his team to this date um, you know, a guy who came in, played on the second line, and we've seen him uh, it's almost turn Kadri's game around. I wanted to look up what the actual Calder Memorial selection criteria was. I don't know if it was just rookie with the most points, but it's um, the voting is conducted by members of the Professional Hockey Writers Association as to who they think is rookie of the year. And based on that, I have to imagine the media is going to go with Connor Bedard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They like that Phenom story. And he's had so much coverage already. I think part of the reason you're not seeing Zari in there is, I, I think outside of our market, it's just not a name people know. Yeah, like uh, if you asked random people who Connor Zari is, they're like, "Huh, what?" This so. Yeah, well, that's it. And Bedard is selling tickets. Faber's, I would say, selling tickets. Fantilli's selling tickets. You're not buying tickets to see Bedard, or sorry, to see Zari. No. So I think. That's probably why you're not seeing Zari in that conversation. Now, if he was, you know, second in points or whatever, maybe, but being number six and being, you know, 10 points difference from Bedard in three games less played, I think that he's great. And I think he'll be a big part of the Flames uh, year, but I just, I don't, I don't see him being anywhere near those top three, especially with the media voting on this. No. Chicago's a big market. I think that that's the story everybody wants to tell. Um, we've talked a little bit about his second question here. Why is Lindholm selected as an all-star instead of Coleman? I've done some more thinking on this, Matt, and tell me what you think about this. We've seen in the past where fans would select the all-stars, guys would be selected and then not want to go. And I'm wondering if the league wanted to not have some of that, I'd say almost a black eye of guys passing up your game. So while we might think, why Lindholm? Maybe they talked to a couple other flames and the guy said, I don't want to go. And Lindholm was the first guy who said, yeah, I'll go. And we don't hear about the other conversation. It just looks like, here's your all-star that's going to the game. Yeah. And especially, like, with a lot of teams, like, they have three, four, five guys that are in the conversation, at least. 
you know, it's not like, oh, there's the, this team only has one guy who knows what end of the stick is up, and the rest of them are just complete boneheads. <laughs> like It's only San Jose. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, you know, like, in situations like that, well, it's obvious, but, you know, it, there are plenty of guys to choose from on the Flames, even though, like, not everybody's having the best of years, and... You know, like, it could have been Sharon Govich, it could have been Coleman, but the guy with the most name recognition out of the likeliest of guys is Lindholm, and... And that's a big part of it, too, yeah. I mean, if you're sending a guy to the national stage, nobody outside this market, so like Zari, nobody outside this market, I think, knows who Sharon Govich is. We didn't even know who Sharon Govich was before he got here. Um, You know, Coleman, I don't think... Well, I think he's a great candidate. I don't know that he's marketable to the league. I don't know that you're going to sell a lot of Coleman jerseys there. I think Weger or Markstrom could have gone. The other thing is it's a game in Toronto. Like, I don't know how many people want to go. It's not like it's in Vegas or some, you know, holiday destination. True. It's in Toronto at the end of your bye week. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I guess the more I've thought of this, that's the only thing that makes sense to me is maybe they didn't want, you know, to, send somebody and then the guy says no I'm not going so maybe they talked to a couple flames and he was the kind of the first one from the top of the list said yeah I'll go if you send me um, and while we've given Lindholm a lot of criticism this year I think we also have to give him praise and one thing I want to praise him for I think he's really helped to reinvigorate Jonathan Huberto since those two have been put on the same line I agree and it, it's one of those where um I think that uh, Huberdeau's taking his game back down to basics in a lot of ways and simplifying and not trying to do too much, you know, like where he'd be forcing plays, which was causing turnovers. I think he's just making more of the simpler passes, even though, like, he's making a lot of really good passes, but, like, he's doing, like, the smarter and safer options most of the time which is allowing him more time and space to do the more challenging and, you know, highlight reel ish plays too. And, you know, it's good to see him kind of getting on the horse again. Yeah. I don't think it's, you know, seven or eight or even, well, maybe not high seven, eight or $9 million worth of work, but it's nice to see that Lindholm is helping reinvigorate our investment in Huberto. Another question here from Andrew, and this is something we've talked about, but we'll get it. We'll do a brief dive into it again. It's clear that we need to make trades to build for a long-term future with the new emerging core and very little hope of truly competing for a cup in the next few years. Who do you guys feel needs to go? Which one's you okay with staying if it works with cap term and would playing our way to the playoff spot, change your mind on things. I personally feel strongly committed to sell a lot while values are high and committing to a uh, fully to a long-term plan with the new arena. Even if we are well on track for playoffs, I can't stand this mushy middle. So before we jump into this, uh, Andrew, if you haven't listened, anyone else who wants to hear this, go back and listen to episode 335 from October 30th this year. Matt and I spent a whole episode kind of breaking down what we think a rebuild would look like with this team. So if you want a whole uh, hour on this, almost, I think it's 47 minutes, go back and listen to, th to episode 335. You can find it on yeah, our website. Yeah, it was the one right Fireside after Chat the Dice Heritage today. Classic game where... It's like, yeah, the team's not good. Then. <laughs> and we talk about every player on the roster and what we can do. But um, let's just answer his questions here. So uh, his first question is, would playing our way into a playoff spot change our mind on a rebuild? We'll start with this. No. I think that even if we're in a playoff spot, I mean, we're not going to be number one in the West. We're going to be, like we talked about earlier, we're going to be, you know, barely in the wild card spot. I think you still got to make the moves. You've still got to move your veterans out because as you say, Andrew, um, the, the value is high. Now you're never going to get more for these guys. If you don't sell them now, they're going to walk away and you're going to get nothing for them. I think you've got to stay that course. If you make the playoffs great, it gives some of your young core playoff experience. If you don't, Oh, well, we'll, you know, we'll come back to it in a couple of years. Well, and it's not like the flames have a fan favorite guy like a Gimla, uh, where like they could, try to keep pushing for the playoff spot, and if they don't make it, well, hey, you know, there was some interesting things because of the playoff race, um, like they did in the final few years of a Ginless tenure here, which, you know, like is exactly what I would personally would like to avoid, because that was always annoying. Uh, but, you know, the Flames realistically... 
like there are three points out of a top six pick um you know like that's not a far fall to get like one of the elite players in this draft and you know if the flames move on from guys like lindholm or tanev or hannafin or markstrom like it's not far to you know establish themselves getting one of those picks and you know like the last time we had a top six pick we got matthew kachuk uh two times previous to that you got sean monahan like you're gonna get a high quality player with that draft pick as long as you're drafting properly and you know like this team has a very good read on players so you know uh, you can stitch the again jersey already and you're good to go <laughs> it's uh that'll be easy just take all the old name plates we got and put a different again yeah, um, yeah just change it, the number and was, there you go <laughs> or just give them the same number yeah. um <laughs> it's well, it is the 24 draft, so you could put the Ginla 24 on it. His dad wore 24 for his first year yeah, here. Yeah, so there you go. Um, I said this last year, and somebody said we should make a t-shirt of it. I said, if you want to see playoff hockey, buy Wranglers tickets. Like, you know, I think that while we don't have that fan favorite like you're talking about on the team, right now it feels like the fan favorite is the young guys, whether that's Wolf, whether that's Coronado, whether that's Zari, whether that's whoever. And if you want to see those young guys get playoff hockey, go buy some Wranglers tickets and watch them play in the playoffs. Because I think if it's anything like last year, they're going to go deep in the playoffs. And like like Andrew says, I'm sick of this mushy middle as well. We either need to... We, we've shown that we can't play our way into a top spot with this core. So I think it's finally time to say, let's do the thing we haven't done yet and let's go in the opposite direction. Yeah, like the Flames went all in with the Gaudreau Kachuk iteration of this team. That's uh, when they got to Foley and Yarn Kroak and, you know, really pushed for it. You have a lot of assets for Yarn Kroak. Yep. And it blew up in their face. They s- failed against the Oilers. And the two star players walked away. And, you know, like it, it's taken a bit to, you know, sort out that, yeah, this team doesn't have enough, you know, and that's not anybody's fault. Like, especially after that kind of a shakeup, you needed to see. You know, because it could have just been a, the same, you know, if Huberto had walked in and had been just as good as he was with the Panthers in his final year there, like the Flames might have not even skipped a beat. But between him and other people regressing and, you know, the depth of the team taking hits, like it's, you know, the writing's on the wall and it's just, you got to do what you got to do. And- I think it might be different if Treliving was still here, but you got to remember, these are all Treliving's guys. He brought them in, right? And I think that, you know, GMs tend to be loyal to their core. And I'm not saying that Conroy's not loyal, but these aren't his guys. And I think he's going to be more open to walking away from them or, you know, finding different pieces than maybe Treliving would have. Yeah. And it's one of those, like, like you're starting to see through the draft and uh, through, uh, trades and acquisitions that you know like the flames are getting bigger uh they're drafting bigger players and you know focusing more on daryl sutter was drafting for us yeah but like also focusing on skill at the same time like they took idar sonev who's a big guy but he's also very skilled hanzig who's big and skilled and you know like uh, moran uh, he's not overly big but he's also tough as nails while being skilled and the skilled part is the key and like even a guy like aj greer for a fourth liner is a fairly decently skilled player so you know it's emphasis on skill but not you know small guys and that's a big departure from the previous group I'm wa- I'm working on some Fireside Chat merch for us this year. I wonder how many of our fans would buy a big and skilled T-shirt. Yes. Big and skilled. Um, I I know I'd probably wear one, <laughs> but it's got so many connotations to it. Yes. We won't go there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Andrew, I think you know. Again, if you want some more info on this, go back and listen to our rebuild episode. We're both with you. Um, I don't think a playoff spot changes anything in our minds, and if it does. As much as I like Conroy as a GM, I think if Conroy changes his strategy because of a the Flames in the playoffs, I question if he's the right guy to move forward with next well, year. Well, and it's just like the Flames in 2003-2004 when they went to the cup finals. 
like the Flames were just coming out of a rebuild and they made that unexpected run all the way to game seven. And instead of just naturally treating it as like the Flames lost in the first round and organically build, they shifted gears and got guys like Jeff Fries and Antonio Monte and Darren McCarty and Alex Tangay, which, you know, did help. Some names I forgot about. Uh, you know, uh, Roman Hammer, like, like a bunch of really good skill players, but it also took away the things that were actually helping the team succeed. And the Flames kind of kneecapped their own rebuild, um, which, you know, that didn't help. And, you know, like, the, this team kind of just needs to do things organically and let it grow organically, which basically every Canadian team always tries to find those shortcuts to succeed and then wonder why nobody's won a cup since 93. And Andrew's saying the same thing that, you know, I've said, and I think you've echoed with me is let's, let's go through this process and let's be ready to compete when we're in our new building. Yeah. Cause we're in, we're in the, the non saddle yes. dome, the Shaw dome or whatever it'll be called. The Rogers Shaw. Yeah. The, Enter the Shodgers dome. Yeah. <laughs> Entertainment the, complex. That's right. The Scotiabank Shodgers Entertainment Center, not a rink downtown. <laughs> we it, we almost need like a, a you know those things that Men in Black use to refer to wipe your memory. Yeah. This is not an arena. <laughs> it's an entertainment Tom, center. <laughs> that's right. The Tommy Lee Jones Entertainment Center. Um, anyway, yeah. The so when we're in our our new entertainment center that happens to have ice on it, hopefully they can be competitive then. I'd love to see the sign up site, Entertainment Center, now with ice. <laughs> um, and the Come last for the entertainment, here from get the complimentary ice with it. <laughs> That's right. Your ticket now includes free ice for the game. No more Calgary Rads games. For those that don't remember the Calgary Rads, that was our pro roller hockey team oh, yeah. for one year. Yeah. Um, anyway, Pulling last comment all here from the, the old, fan. you know, Calgary history out of here. It's it's our job. We'll see if we can make a cannons reference for we're out of here. <laughs> um, Terry Williams on Facebook just had a comment echoing what we said earlier he said well Kadri was in last year while having his worst year as in terms of the all-star game now it seems to be in now he seems to be in fine form Lindholm may not be on par for his best year but he's a huge part in getting Goudreau going and now feeding Sharon Govich regularly he's an all-star if not necessarily this year so I think what he's saying is Kadri didn't look the best he went last year now he seems to be in great form um, Sharon Govich, not an all-star, but he will be one year. Maybe, you know, Lindholm, maybe there's this thing for Flames that they go the year before they get good. I kind of hope not because I don't want Lindholm to be good next year if he's not here. But, yeah, he reminded me that Kadri was our selection last year, and that was kind of an odd choice too. Yeah, and realistically, because it's an all-star game, like everybody's been kind of trashing Huberto, so you can't really... Yeah, you know, like he has name profile. Um, the only other guys that really have that higher end name profile are Condry and Markstrom. So, you know, it, it made sense last year with like everything going a little sideways for the team that uh, Condry went because Condry was the name value last yeah, year. Yeah, because he played a lot better than Huberto throughout the year. Yeah, and he was still coming off a year removed from the Stanley Cup, yeah. too. Yeah, and Lindholm. Yeah, you know, like realistically, he should have been an All Star two years ago when when he scored the forty goals. So I think that you know not everybody has forgotten that he scored forty, and 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 maybe that's the thing. Maybe there's a delayed reaction. But uh, I'm I'll tell you right now. I saw today that there's now celebrity captains for the All Star game: Michael Bublé, Tate McRae, somebody. I guess she's from Calgary. I don't know. I'm an old man. I don't know who these people are. Will Arnett. And Justin Bieber and I'm like, yeah, I'm not watching this game this year. No. So I don't know. I don't know which one of those weird teams um, Lindholm's going to be on. Somebody can let us know on social media. I really don't care which team he's going to be on. But Huberto would not be the worst guy in the All Star game if we've got uh, if we've got Justin Bieber there. Yeah. Well, appara captain. apparently he designed the jerseys too, and they are the most ugly jersey I've ever seen. It looks like well, I'd a, imagine he's not he's not a fashion designer. No, it looks like literally he ripped off Carl Junior's lo logos and just put them on a jersey. Like it's really, really, he's really not a bad. Fashion designer. No, it's just really bad. 
Yeah, it's I don't know the whole thing. It, it almost seems like it's the Justin Bieber All Star Game. Yeah, it's. I didn't even know he was still relevant until this year. I'm learning something. Yeah, new. I know. I thought that ended like five or six years ago, but apparently. You and I are old guys, Matt. Who knows? Yeah, well, I I tend to look at it as we have musical taste. <laughs> and, you know, that that's below the bar, you know. I listen to In the Dome and Brass Bonanza. There you yeah. go. <laughs> um, anyway, I think that wraps up for this week. Just want to remind everybody, we have a trivia night coming up. We're going to be rejoining our friends at Bow River Brewing. And on February 8th, during the first and second intermission of the hockey game, we're going to be doing Flames Trivia. We'd love to have you come out. If you want to play solo, you're free to do that if you want to steal all the glory. Or grab your line mates, come out and play as a team, or meet some new uh, Fireside Chat listeners there and join a team. You can play either solo or as a team. We're going to have some great prizes at the end of the night. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have great beer and pizza deals like we did last time for our meetup. It'll be $13 pizzas instead of 17 and uh, six dollars for a sixteen ounce beer, right fresh from their tap. Any one of their taps, it's a lot of fun there. We had so much fun at our meetup. It's a great spot to watch a game, and you're not going to get better game day pricing than that. So Matt and I hope you'll come down for trivia night. If you want more information, you can go to either our Facebook page where there's a an event post at the top, or our website firesidechat.ca, and you'll see trivia night in the navigation. I'm excited, Matt. How about Same you? Same here. Always looking forward to it. We've got some questions. You know, even if you don't know a lot about Flames trivia, we've got some questions that everybody's going to be able to answer. I don't want to give them away, but everyone will be able to answer. And if you if you don't, that's okay. It's, it's a great chance to learn. It's a great chance to have some fun. Maybe join up with somebody else. See if they can help you. Work as a team. Great way to meet some new friends. But we're making this fairly approachable for everybody. Yeah. And if nothing else, just come on out and enjoy watching the Flames play that night. Which team is no good? Edmonton. Easy. Everybody can learn that one. That that could be our practice question. Yep. Wh- which team do we not like? Answer all. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, come on out. It'll it'll be a fun night. We hope all of our listeners can join us. And feel free to bring your friends, bring uh, your Flames fans, bring your spouses, bring your brothers, your siblings, whoever. Um, I know we had a whole group of people there. I'd say we had about a dozen people for the meetup when we did it, and. We all had a lot of fun, so we'd love to have you join us this time. Yep, and speaking of the Oilers, they're apparently signing Corey Perry, which I think we could have both called the second he was bought out. <laughs> they they take Evander Kane after his gambling stuff. They take Corey Perry after his bad behavior. Yeah, they, they took almost... the Vert, Vertanen from Vancouver after his whole nonsense. It's like, like if you're, you know, if you have troubles... <laughs> No longer the city champions, the city of second chances. Yeah. Well, let's look ahead to the week that is for the Flames. I win our first week in the prediction game. It's one nothing now. I've correctly predicted they'd beat uh, Arizona, lose to Toronto and Edmonton, and that was the result that we had. So uh, let's see if I can keep it going. This week, the Flames play three games. They have a Tuesday night game against the St. Louis Blues here at the Dome. Thursday night, Johnny Goudreau and the Columbus Blue Jackets come to town. Those are both 7 p.m. starts. And then Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday, the Calgary Flames take on the Chicago Blackhawks. Matt, what are you thinking? Uh, They will beat St. Louis because of the fact that St. Louis is a competent hockey team. And then they will (laughs) lose to both Chicago and Columbus because we play down to their level. (laughs) That's an interesting way of looking at I think St. Louis is two points down on us in the one, standings right now. One point. One, yep. okay. <laughs> That's as good a logic as any, I yep. guess. Uh, well, we've lost, uh, what, three or four in a row to Chicago, and we lost both last year to Columbus, so, you know, not inaccurate. <laughs> you know, like, Chicago would not have... Uh, Connor Bedard if it wasn't for us being terrible <laughs> against them they owe us yes. one they just forfeit the game they owe us Patrick Kane because we mailed it in on the last game of the season that year against Edmonton and <laughs> do we have future considerations we can cash in with them yep. <laughs> hey somebody go back and look through all the trades in history there's got to be futures somewhere in there Yeah. hey guys uh, we helped you get two franchise players you know there is a forfeit yeah, rule. You owe us two points. Slide, slide us a little bit, you know. Like <laughs> That's right. Actually, at this point, we probably don't want the two points. Find a way to lose us two points if we're close to the bottom. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. You're right. It's two teams that we have more trouble with than we should. 
and the Blues. And I find the Blues games usually pretty close games. Yeah. I'm going to go slightly different than you. I'm going to be a bit of a homer. Um, I think we win against St. Louis, and I think we'll beat the Blue Jackets just because I want them to beat um, Goudreau. I think they'll lose Chicago, though. Yeah. I don't know how much the f- the players still are you know, mad at Goudreau or don't want him to win or if anybody cares anymore. Uh, most of this team wasn't here when he was here, but I to me, there's still some of I, I want Goudreau to lose in the Dome. Yeah. Pretty much. I'm still not over it. No. Maybe I should also take a leave of absence for mental health, but I'm still not over it. Yeah. Uh, how would you say, um, with Columbus being as bad as they are, I am starting to feel a little bad for him. Like, I knew this was going to happen, you know, because Columbus... Oh, we all knew it. I mean, you and I said it in our first episode after he left, that he's going to look back and regret this, because he's not. He's gonna. He's there for eight years, and he's probably not going to make the playoffs for more than two or three of them. Yeah. and If he's lucky. Yeah, like, and they're pathetically bad, and you know, like they're the fifth worst team in the NHL, and they're gonna stay there. And yeah, like I do feel bad for him because, like, even though he did kind of mess the team up quite a lot, how would you say the off ice reasons why he left with his father having that heart attack and not being able to go because of COVID nonsense? I get it. It's just. I get you, it too, you, you, but you, I guess... you also, you know, it, you don't like seeing people, you know, like have everything blow up in their face when they are trying to do something somewhat positive for their own family. It's just, yeah, like this did mess up as badly as possible for him. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand why he left. I still wish it would have been different. He would have at least, you know, worked with the Flames to get something for him, but. Um, I don't know. I, he wants to be in the States and he's, I'd say he's paid a, a price with his career because he's not going to get the cup anytime soon to go down there as opposed to, you know, staying here, COVID's over and maybe seeing dad a little bit more. Now. Yeah. But if he doesn't want to be here, I don't want him here. That's what it comes down to. Oh, you know, it's like this, uh, this guy, what was his name in Philadelphia? Right, that wanted out, and all the fans are upset now. They trade him. I'm like, if he doesn't want to be there, let him go. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, Cutter Gautier. Yeah. Yeah. Cutter Gautier. Like, you know, yes, you lost that prospect. If he doesn't want to be there, let him go. The Flames. You know, Adam Fox didn't want him to be here. They let him go. Like, if the guy doesn't want to be there, find him a new home. Yep. It doesn't do you any good to have a guy on your team who doesn't want to be there. Exactly. And we recovered from the Adam Fox thing. Yeah. Philly will be fine. Oh, exactly. And the Flames will get you know on from all of this as well and you know like they're in the process of retooling and yada 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 so all right matt well i will talk to you next week and uh we'll see if we can beat these two lousy teams and as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.